Okay, hello everyone and Ramadan Kareem. Uh, as you know, last time we talked about the part one of this three part um, webinar. Last time we talked about case assessment and smile design. Uh, and we were very happy with the feedback we got from you. So hopefully you will find this part two informative and entertaining. I don't know if it would be entertaining, but hopefully it will be informative. Um, so in, in today's uh, outline, we will talk about shade matching or shade selection. Uh, and we will talk about mock-up, try and then we will follow that with the preparation and then with the impression and sending the patient back home with temporization methods. So as you can see, it's, um, it's a chronologically ordered procedure. So that's why it makes sense to, to go with shade matching first. And why did we choose to talk about shade matching? Because of the dehydration effect. Dehydration, as you all know, starts immediately. In this case, we did this tooth and you can see how the color is opaque and white and you can see the white lines appeared immediately where in this case, uh, in the same tooth, it was not uh, apparent at all. So that's why you have to take your shade, mm, uh, shade selection or shade matching uh, immediately when you see the patient. Uh, sometimes even before you do anything else and even before rubber dam because if you place your rubber dam and do a quick restoration and then you will say okay I'll take the shade guide later it's too late and you have to wait 24 hours for the shade to go back so make sure you go you, you choose your shade and here we will talk a little bit about the anatomy of the, sh the tooth shade I will help you understand how to look deeper into the shade and how to choose it um, in a more predictable way. So here we will talk about Vanini's five dimensions of color. And let me just do something very quick. If you don't mind, just let me make my cursor bigger because it will be easier for you to see where I'm pointing. Okay. Good. So uh, we will talk about Vanini's five dimensions of colors. What are those five dimensions? The first one is the hue. What is the hue? It's the color of the tooth. Is it yellow or is it red? Something like that. The hue is the blue, green, red, yellow of colors. And in dentistry and teeth, we mainly have A and B series. And most recently, uh, Vanini started to discard the C and D series from the Vita Shade Guide because he says it's basically the same as A and B, just lower in brightness, which takes us to the second dimension of the color, which is the brightness or what we like to call value, which is if we choose, if you choose A, and then we will have to see, okay, is it A1, A2, A3, A4, which is how bright or dark the color is. Uh, those two dimensions are basics, but what will come next is very interesting stuff. Uh, intensives, we call these intensives, these white spots on the tooth. And these have to be communicated with the lab if we are trying to mimic the natural tooth shade. So uh, you have to tell your lab where the location of these intensives are and how intense are they? Because you can see here it's very light and you can see here it's very opaque. So you have to communicate with that with your lab depending on the diagram from Benini. Next, we will talk about opalescence. Opalescence is this effect for the enamel where you can see through the enamel and you, you don't have anything behind the enamel like dentine. And this is only, can, this can only be seen in the incisal edge of the tooth. And it can be a normal mammalone or the middle mammalone can be split into two, or it can be multiple small mammalones or a straight line, or in aged patients, it can be a little bit 
yellowish because it has some stains seeping into the tooth. Uh, the third, uh, the fifth uh, dimension and the last one is any special characterizations like any lines, any cracks, anything else you want to include in your um, shade matching. And usually when, you're, when we're doing veneers, we don't really incorporate much of these effects in the, into the tooth except for the opalescence because we like it, but we're not gonna be putting any crack lines or anything, but it's very important to understand this when you're matching single tooth or two, two teeth. And here is an interesting thing about the tooth. Uh, you can see here in the gingiva, I chose this color and you can see how it's mimicked completely, but I'm dragging the same color to the incisal edge and you will see it doesn't match anymore. Same goes for the incisal edge going the other way. So when you choose a composite and, uh, or a veneer that has a mono tone and one color only, you will not end up with a natural tooth uh, um, appearance because it will look fake. Because no, natural teeth have a nice gradient to, that, to them. Okay, let's talk about practical tips. As I like to share with you more practical, st practical stuff. Uh, shade matching tips. When you are doing them shade matching, make sure your uh, shade tab is at the same level as your teeth when you're taking the photo or when you're assessing it with your eyes. Why is that? Because when you put the shade tab closer to your eyes, uh, it will appear brighter because closer objects appear brighter, as you know. And if you put it do, too back, too, too far back, it will appear darker because there's not enough light hitting it. So make sure it's in the same uh, plane. And make sure you assess the color from an arm distance. Just keep a distance between you and the patient a little bit, just an arm distance, not too much because it will help you take in the, the, the shade uh, perception uh, better. But if you are trying to see those small details and the ones we talked about in the 5D uh, categorization of the color, you might want to take macro photography or your magnification loops to see the things that your eye is not seeing naturally, okay? So if you're taking the normal shade, look, with your bare vision from a distance. And if you're trying to assess the small details, you can use my uh, magnification. And here is another important thing. We always hear about why we need to wet the surface of the tooth before we take impression. But we, uh, it's uh, very rare that we get to, to, to get the explanation of why is that the case. Why do we need to wet the surface? You can see here that the wet surface doesn't have surface texture as the dry surface. So when you have a wet surface, you can take in the shade without any influence from the tooth reflection and the texture. So always match your shade on a wet surface. Um, the shade guide, you can use whatever shade guide you want. Just make sure your lab is using the same shade guide. You can use uh, custom shade guides. You can do whatever you want, but w one small trick, arrange the shade tabs, not, in, uh, not according to hue, which is A1, A2, A3, A4, B1, B2, B3, B4, no. As, uh, arrange them from white, uh, from brightest, which is highest in value, to the lowest in value. Uh, and nowadays, as I told you, I am not dealing with C and D. I'm just looking at from A to B. So I typically have B1, it's the brightest, and then A1, and then B2, and then A2, and then I don't remember, you have to arrange them from the brightest to the darkest, okay? So when you wanna take the shade, first glance, just narrow down your options. So from the first glance, look and you will see, okay, maybe A1, maybe B1, maybe B2. All right, these are my options. Just discard the other ones. Narrow down the window that you're going to take uh, your shade from and then 
assess each color, each shade tab for no longer than five seconds because you will get vision fatigue and you can reset or rest your eye by staring at a gray color and not at a blue color. Okay. Don't forget to remove the external stains. And this one is a dramatic way to, to explain it, but we can always clean the teeth in the prior visit. And you can see that there's a huge difference between the, sh the, 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 the appearance of the tooth. Um, use Profiget. I, I like to use Profiget, which is a very gentle powder. You, it goes through the tooth surface and it cleans it very effectively. Let's talk about photography and shade matching because it's one of the most important tools in dentistry. And nowadays we are hearing about more technologies that allow your lab to do the shade matching without even um, having to choose the shade itself. You just take a photo through a software and you send it to your lab. But let's talk about pra practical tips, photography and shade matching. What is white balance? White balance is this scale. I want you to remember. Red is warm, blue is cool, cool is cold, red is fire, hot. So you can see here, this is a warm picture. This is not accurate. And here you can see this is a cool picture. It's also not accurate. Both of these pictures will not be uh, communicating very well with your dental lab technician because they are not the natural uh, way. And I can give you an example when you have, when you sit in a room and you turn on the, the, the yellow light, your room will look different than in, if you put on the white light. And of course you want to be taking your shade in a white, uh, uh, white balanced light setting, which is 5,500 uh, Kelvin. So in this case, the correct uh, white balance is the picture in the middle and it shows the natural um, white balance. And this is a software trick that you can do after you take the photo. You can just play with your photo in your phone or any uh, uh, photo editing software and you can see the temperature and play with it and you will see how the, the photo will be adjusted. And this is something you need to uh, train your eyes to assess and with time you will gain that skill. Some, uh, some more uh, photography tips for shade matching. I suggest if you have a professional camera, you, sh you shoot in RAW format. Why? Because when you take a photo in the JPEG, JPEG format, you are taking a compressed photo that you cannot do anything with. But if you take a photo in RAW, you will have much higher, um, um, much, uh, much more um, data to work with your image. So you can make it brighter, you can make it uh, darker, you can play with the colors, you can really do a lot of stuff if you shoot in RAW. Uh, it's, um, uh, you know, the camera takes a photo and then its processor gives you the J JPEG. So it gives you a compressed version, but you want to keep the RAW photo so you can do some of the things that I will tell you about. You can always also use a polarizer filter on your lens. Uh, and what does the polarizer do? I will give you an example to make it easy. You know, when you are taking a photo of a lake with a lot of fish and stones underneath the surface, when you take it with a normal uh, lens, you will just see the reflection of the sun uh, reflecting on the surface of the lake. But if you take the same photo in the same area with a polarizer, the reflection of the sun will disappear and you will see underneath the surface, you will see the fish and you will see the stones beneath the surface of the lake. So that's why it's very important in dentistry because you are eliminating the reflections of the outer surface, the enamel, and you will be communicating the real data with your lab technician. It's a very important trick. Um, one last trick in photography and dentistry and shade matching is you can take this photo and assuming you shot it in RAW, you can go to your software image uh, editing software like Lightroom or any other software. There's a lot of softwares. And then you can just lower the exposure. 
decrease the brightness and increase the contrast. And you will see a lot of details that are not possible to see here. And of course, this is not a real situation. But if you want to tell your uh, lab technician that the patient has a slightly visible intensives, you can make it uh, more visible so he can see it, okay? And it's, it's also very good for you when you're doing composite restorations you can see those details. Um, lab communication. I like to communicate with my lab for most of my cases. The, the, the cases that require a lot of communication, I visit my lab technician. We talk with, about the case. And I like to talk about the visual communication. Visual communication is you have to tell your lab, OK, this black area here don't worry about it don't conceal it because this is a fiber post and here you can see there's a gingiva recession don't worry about it i know and then you can tell him about them some stuff you want from the case you will make his life easier don't assume your lab knows what you want so that's everything about shade matching next we will talk about the mock-up try-in mock-up try-in why do we do it why do we take after we do the DSD, the digital smile design from the last webinar. And why do we make the wax up and then we uh, convert it into the putty? All of this because it's easier to make modifications on the wax, on the teeth, with composite, with wax, than it is to make them with ceramic. And you are effectively minimizing baking of the ceramic, which makes the visual appearance of your ceramics much more appealing and much much better so you are uh, you rec uh, you will require less modifications from your lab technician if you follow these steps and of course if you put your mock-up on the mouth and you have an idea of what your patient wants this will guide your preparation as we will discuss in the next slides some quick tips about the putty and the mock-up. You want your putty to be thick when you're taking it off the, of the wax because you don't want a thin putty that will easily be, a, be deformed. Because um, if, you, if you put a thin putty layer of the mouth, you can just twist it and it will not give you an accurate replica of the wax that you spent so much time to perfect. So make sure your putty is thick enough to resist uh, deformation. Um, and your putty should be, should have some resistance. I will explain to you what I mean. When we are doing veneers, we are um, basically we are uh, depending on the lingual side of the teeth to have our stop of the putty. We have the support and stability from the tooth itself because the tooth from the lingual part, from the palatal part is intact. So, but if we're doing full crowns, we have to use the other teeth. Let's assume we have our uh, one six and two six uh, uh, not, go, not undergoing any treatments. So we have to include that in the putty so we uh, gain some resistance and stability. And we can also gain the same uh, stability from the gingiva surrounding the teeth. So think about that when you're doing a putty because if you cut around too much and you put it, it will just keep going and you don't have any stop uh, point for your putty. Of course, you want to dry the teeth because the material will not stick on the tooth if it's wet and it will just come out with your impression and you will have to do it again and again and again. Um, modify directly. Yeah. Check the results with your patient. See how does he like them. Check the canting, check the, pr the, the protrusion, check how they look. And of course, don't check the translucency or the color because it's just plastic. It's too 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 soon to make any judgment about this. So uh, you can make the modifications directly. You can tell your patient, oh, what do you think? Oh, maybe doctor, it's too long. Okay, let's make them shorter. 
all right, that's good. Maybe I want to shorten the canines too. Then you shorten the canines. And then you maybe narrow, narrower incisor. Everything you want to do, do it now. Get 80% to what you want uh, for the final results. And then you can take alginate. Why do you want to take alginate? Do you know why? Because this is the approved temporary uh, results. This will help your lab by giving you something similar. So don't forget this step. I'm not, I, I, I doubt a lot of dentists do this, but now you know why we need to take alginate after we get the approval for the temporary mock-up. Then prepare over the teeth. Don't remove your mock-up. Keep it in place. If you have um, plans for the, for the preparation, make the thickness grooves on the centers, laterals, canines, premolars, just make it, you know, um, you will have an idea of how thick your veneers will be. And then you can make the, the grooves depending on this. So that's everything for the mock-up. Now we will go for the real deal, the preparation. Okay. Let's talk about the burrs because these are the most fundamental tool we use on a daily basis. Burrs, if they are too thin, if they are too thin, red line, why? Because they will dig grooves in your preparation. You cannot make a nice preparation if they are too thin. What about thick burrs? Maybe it will be easier? No. Uh, because it will be very difficult to give you the impression, the preparation you want without damaging the gingiva at the finish line and without damaging the proximal surfaces. So it will be too much to handle. So you want to be in the green zone, which is around 1.5 millimeter here. And I always like to use a round and burr cylindrical or or slightly conical this is conical this is cylindrical but always round end why do i prefer round end you can use whatever you want but i will tell you my opinion because in preparations it's much easier to have smooth 45 degrees chamfer finish line than having a 90 degree uh, and it's much harder to finish it and to give it to the to the lab technician with a good impression so I prefer a chamfer finish line and you can use whatever you want. Uh, the science doesn't contradict, uh, doesn't uh, stand against any uh, finish line, but uh, this is my preference. And for me, the, the burr will only dig half way through the preparation at the finish line. So I'm just using this outline here to create my finish line. You see? All right. And I always start with rough, coarse diamond burrs, and then I go with the polishing with the yellow or, or red fine diamond burrs. So we start, you're starting with the buckle aspect. Buckle aspect before and after. In this case, we didn't prepare a lot. Why? Because the required thickness should have already been established in the treatment plan in the previous webinar. We talked about how you're planning to do your preparation, if you remember. And that depends on the current shade of the teeth and the desired shade of the teeth. So if we ha already have a bright tooth, a bright dentition, and let's say A1, all right? And we're going with BL4 for the final shade. There's really nothing to mask here. We, we don't really need to prep the teeth too much because we're not trying to conceal anything. But if you have an A3 tooth and we want to make it BL4, you really have to prep a good amount of, of, uh, of the tooth material from the buckle aspect to give your lab technician space to build your ceramic very well and can um, uh, conceal the, the, the dark shade of the tooth. So the current and desired shade, they will dictate how much you will prepare. Your desired ceramic buildup, do you want to make it monolithic or do you want to build it with feldspathic over the, um, 
the core of the veneer and where do you want your veneers to be if my patient has um, protruded teeth of course i will need to prepare much much more than if the patient are already reclined inside i don't really need to prepare a lot so these are the factors that will guide your decision making uh, in regards of the range of the preparation which is typically between 0 0.5 to 2 millimeters use thickness groups if you are unsure of the thickness you're doing it's very very um, it's it will help you and of course use the, your mock-up as we talked about uh, the previous slides uh, use your mock-up for guiding your preparation for the back buckle aspect always make sure you have this incisal reclination in here why because i see a lot of dentists do sub do the preparation very well here but they forget to give their lab technician a space to work with the tooth here and then the tooth will be one plane and the lab technician will have a lot of space to work here but then he's he does he where where can he put his build up and this area is the area where he will have to put the opalescence effect and he will have to build the, the effect of the incisal edges. So give your lab technician these two planes of preparation. So your first plane is here and the second plane is here. And it doesn't really have to have this two angles. Just finish it and make it round if you like. Uh, let's talk about the next aspect, which is the incisal aspect. Uh, this will also depend, the preparation will depend on your desire for the final outcome. Where do you want your teeth to be? Do you want to make them longer? Do you want to make them shorter? And this will dictate how much you prepare from the incisal edge. Uh, and that's just common sense, right? And of course, if you're going to build the veneer from one single monolithic material of or if you want to put those nice translucent effects at the incisal edge this will dictate how much you will prepare from the tooth so the design most most of my cases if not all i do butt joint which is like this 90 or slightly less than 90 degrees preparation and this will help you with the seating of the veneers with the final cementation which we'll discuss in part three when you put the veneer here you will have a stop from this incisal aspect so you will know that it's a good seating for the veneer uh, in, com in uh, comparison to the no incisal preparation where you, when you're just putting a facing you are depending on the gingival aspect for your stability of the veneer and of course you want to smooth this transition line because we don't want any 90 degrees in my preparation as for the design of the lingual overlap i don't really use it that much unless we're converting the veneer to a crown or semi-crown or a lingual overlap for other reasons like we are raising the bite but i don't typically use it for the normal uh, everyday uh, veneers cases why because the rationale of the lingual overlap is that we are uh, we need the retention form uh, and and that's really not important as you can see your bonding will keep the veneer in place without needing to do any lingual finish lines and you don't need to complicate the preparation and introduce uh, the, uh, any other aspects like the entrance uh, line and all these things insertion line i mean uh, proximal aspect okay let's talk about the proximal aspect your objective needs to be that you will prepare the mesial and the distal of the teeth in a way that you cannot see the junction between the veneer and the tooth for the final results so you have to go deep you have to go deep close to the co uh, to the contact points but you don't have to reach them all the time because this kind of preparation is enough maybe you can go more from here but this is nice and that's it this is the proximal aspect everything about it but sometimes you find caries here so you have to include your preparation 
uh, of this area or you find a defective restoration just prepare it okay of course you will not put your veneers over uh, defective restorations and according to our to our plan in the digital smile design or the wax up if we want to make the tooth narrower or wider you can prepare and open these contacts depending on your plan maybe you have a very wide central here and you want to make your laterals a little bit wider and the centrals a little bit narrower so you have to open these spaces so you can give this um, shifting of the location of the teeth uh, otherwise it will not be uh, possible for your lab technician and sometimes we convert our preparation to crowns when we see undermined walls or tooth structure we want to protect them i don't i don't i cannot really build a veneer here because this is all composite and this is a fiber post this is a fiber post and root canal so i converted those two to a crown and this one was all already converted to a crown because you can see here composite composite i wanted to have a nice uh, lingual extension and here mesial part also we opened it but the distal part was very good so we didn't need to open it so follow your tooth check your undermined surfaces and prepare accordingly now for the most complicated part of the preparation the, gin the gingival aspect and it's really easy if you just listen to me and follow my um, my sequence. First of all, why do we need a finish line? So you know how important a finish line for the gingival health, but it's also important for your veneer seating as we talked with the, with the bite joint for the uh, incisal aspect. If you don't have a finish line and you just make it a smooth transition, it will be somehow difficult for your lab technician to know where should he stop his veneers and it will be difficult for you to put the veneers and know where are they sitting. So a finish line will help you in the seating and of course with, obviously with uh, giving the patient a correctly contoured uh, restoration that will not damage the gingiva. So I use chamfer for the most of ca my cases as I discussed with the birth selection, I use chamfer and I start sent, uh, with equigingival preparation here and I do this before any retraction and rubber dams, okay? Because any rubber dam will be placed here. It will just move my gingiva and I don't have a reference point anymore. So I prepare here. I know where my gingiva will be, all right? And then I will put my retraction cord. As you can see, it will push the gingiva and then I will prepare a 0 0.5 millimeters. So I will go slightly below the equal gingiva. But if I place my rubber dam, I, I can't know where's that anymore because the clamp will push the gingiva. Whether it's heavy rubber dam or whatever, or even the clamp itself, it will push uh, the, uh, uh, the gingiva. As you can see here, this here, the gingiva is already up apically um, placed now. So I cannot if I didn't have my finish line, for example, I don't know where's my gingiva. So I don't, I don't feel confident to prepare in an exact way. So we go 0 0.5 millimeter below the gingival, equigingival line. So that's slightly subgingival. And that's very nice when you have a nice color for your tooth and you can just hide that ugly transition between tooth and ceramic tuck it inside the gingiva, nobody will see it. But if you have a darkly discolored tooth, you really have to go deeper. Why? Because here the tooth will show through, through the gingiva. It will, you, you know some patients uh, complain from this dark discolored tooth. That's what we are talking about, okay? So we can go deeper, uh, subgingival like. Um, sometimes we go one millimeter, one point five millimeter, subgingival, and we have to respect the biologic width. Okay. Respect the biologic width. 
finishing and polishing, uh, why do we need to finish the restoration? Any sharp edges are stress concentration points. So you want your this uh, um, almost like a melting wax preparation. Everything needs to be smooth. Transition lines need to be smooth um, because it will re reduce the concentration points. It will make the lab uh, cast easier to deal with. And it's, it just looks good uh, for your ego. Um, electric handpiece. It's very important to use electric hand pieces in this case, in this step, finishing and polishing. Why do you need to, to use electric hand piece? Um, as you know, the air powered hand pieces, they are good for cutting, but they don't give you controlled rotation of the burr. That's where the electric hand piece comes in. And it's just, I know not a lot of dentists get to use them, but just read about them, try to get one. It's not very expensive. Um, it's really nice to work with. It gives you such a great control over your preparation. I like to finish my preparation with them. Um, and this, this is the final uh, point. You want to open your contacts with a floss, a thick floss, sometimes a metal, um, metal piece of metal or something. Just open the proximal points between the teeth. Why? Because you want the putty to come and collect this uh, area between the teeth. You don't want any food debris or any anything stuck in here. If the putty can come, it will make your lab technician's life much easier by separating the teeth on the cast. I think they call it pindexing. And then you can uh, give him separated teeth and he can work easier and give you better results. After you finished preparation, just assess your preparation from multiple surfaces. If you want to assess the protrusion of the teeth, you want to look from up, up, uh, like uh, look over the patient. If you want to see, uh, is my preparation symmetrical? Look from the front. If you want to see the profile, check the profile, check the protrusion. Don't just, okay, I'm good. I prepared the teeth. Let's go take impression. No, this step, you will, dis you will discover some mistakes. You will see, okay, maybe I need to prepare the canine more because my lab will, be, will think it's too big. Maybe the central needs a little bit more preparation. This is where you can make the magic happen, this step. Um, and a quick point about the posture and asking the patient to move. Uh, a lot of dentists re are reluctant to, to make the patient work with them. Ask your patient to move right, left, up, left, whatever. Jo don't do the changing of the positions. Your patient should do it because um, it will be much better for you to assess the case and it will be much better for your posture when you are doing your um, preparations. One last tip, uh, I think. Uh, use the handpiece as a reference tool. Okay, when you are preparing two central incisors, right? You want them to be at the same plane. You want them to be on the same level. So use your angle and the angulation of your burr and the handpiece itself, the handpiece head. You can just copy it to the next tooth. Same angulation, just copy it without changing it and you get two symmetrical uh, preparations. So you have a great reference tool with you, which is your hand piece. So use it. And that's everything about the preparation. Let's talk about the impression. Um, so this step, this is the most important step in the impression actually, the retraction. What's our objective from retracting the gingiva? We want to, to physically move the, the gingiva away from our preparation without dam damaging the gingiva in the process. So just tuck it gently. Try to be gentle with your force. It doesn't really need a lot of force. And controlled force will help you avoid bleeding. And the size, this is a common question. What is the size of your retraction cord? Most of the time I use number one. But if I see a thick gin, bio gingival, uh, gingival profile, 
I will use a thicker retraction cord. I make my decisions on the fly. I check, okay, maybe the, the number one is too thin. Like you can see here, it's too thin. You cannot see it. So in this case, I will either put an additional piece of number one retraction cord, or I will just, if I see this happening everywhere, I'll just remove the retraction cord. I will not put it. I will put a bigger one because it will physically move my gingiva. I want it to be visible. The retraction cord needs to be visible because, because if you don't retract enough, you will have a very thin place for, for your light but body, uh, for your light body material. And when you take it out, it will tear. But if you retract well enough, you will give your, butt, uh, your light body uh, thick enough space to invade. And then when you remove it, it will be more resistance, uh, resistant to tearing. So physical rest retraction, I want you to think about this. And you can also use the, 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 the retraction pace, very nice. But you know, the most important factor is moisture control and bleeding that includes bleeding so use adrenaline with those cords and think about the size of your cord that will uh, physically stop the bleeding by pressing on the gingiva a little bit make your retraction cord connected for easier removal one piece you can remove them all or just instead of 10 teeth you put one, two, three, ten, ten 10 pieces and you have to remove one, one, one. You can connect them. I try to tell my nurse, okay, cut five veneers, two uh, connected veneers, two separate crowns and three connected veneers. And then I will put them and then I will have to remove just three pieces of cords, not 10. And always keep a handle to remove um, just common sense and remove, tell your uh, nurse to remove the retraction cord gently. Do not uh, remove it like this because you will introduce the enemy, the bleeding. And of course, of course, uh, always ask your patient to be very good with the oral hygiene because it will make your life easier. So moisture is the enemy. What is moisture? Moisture is saliva, blood, adrenaline. Adrenaline is something you didn't expect me to say, right? Because the adrenaline on the retraction cord is also moisture. So make sure you don't have that. Uh, after you put your retraction cord, just make sure um, everything is dry. Of course, you don't want to dry, over dry vital teeth. You can use gauze. You can use a gentle air. Blood you want to use the chemical uh, hemostatic agents, adrenaline, and you want to physically uh, stop it, the blood, and you want a good oral hygiene. And as for the saliva, you want to train your nurse to have good um, retraction of the cheek and the, uh, the soft tissue. And I like to put cotton rolls sometimes in the upper area, sometimes in the lingual uh, posterior side of the right and left side of the tongue because it's a difficult uh, place to control. So use cotton rolls. It will uh, be effective. You will thank me. Impression. Think about tissue relapse. After you remove your retraction cord, within seconds, the tissue will start moving back to its position. So you have to put your light body immediately. Okay, so what I like to do is remove the, my nurse will remove the cord and I will follow her with my light body. This way you minimize any bleeding because you're immediately putting the impression and you um, minimize any tissue relapse. Um, uh, you want a stable impression. When you put the impression, just keep it stable five minutes. Uh, it depends on the impression. I don't like to use fast setting materials, but do whatever you want. Um, make sure you, you have a uniform thickness of your putty. Don't let the putty show through the metal tray or the, the tray of your, you know, the, the tray material. So uh, don't push your putty all the way up. Uh, 
keep it uniform and make it stable. And I like to give this tip to my nurse, five minutes of meditation, <laughs> and then we just use an external timer to not wait for too long, five minutes. You will have to read the instructions. Uh, I like to talk about Aquasil uh, from my personal experience. Uh, it's a very uh, good product. Uh, it has high hydrophilicity and high tearing resistance. And I really like this uh, important factor, high hydrophilicity, because one of the times I was taking the impression and my nurse uh, was, um, you know, she's very well trained, um, but she forgot, removed the mirror um, soon, um, uh, like um, sooner than I would like. And there was some moisture introduced to the preparation and I gave her that look and I continued. I cannot stop because I'm already in the middle of my work. Uh, so I thought, okay, I have to redo this impression. And I was using Aqua Seal Ultra and actually I'm, I'm talking real here. I'm not selling you the product. I was surprised. It's a very forgiving product because it has high hydrophilicity. So it gave me this impression, very nice details. Um, so this is a nice product. Just use a good product that gives you good quality. One last thing about impressions, the alginate. Alginate is something we don't really think about, but there's one important tip I will give you. I will not talk about powder, water, mixture, stuff like that. You, you, you know that already, but I want to tell you to take the, the alginate, the mixed alginate, and put it on the surface of the teeth. Uh, of course, you, if you're doing the upper teeth, you will take the lower teeth with alginate and just make sure you push your finger on these surfaces, the sulcus and those hard to reach areas because this is where the air will be trapped if you put the impression immediately. But if you physically put the material, you will make sure that you will capture these areas and you will get a better occlusion for your final restorations, whether you're doing single tooth or um, complete full mouth. All right, we finished four aspects. Let's talk about the temporization, my least favorite subject. Um, uh, so why am I saying this? Because it's a challenging aspect and it's in, it gives you inconsistent results depending on multiple factors. So it's prudent of you to minimize the waiting time. Make sure you're not making the patient wait for too long until the veneers are ready, okay? Because these things are, they fracture, they debone sometimes, and it's not optimum. And if you have to, you have to spend some time perfecting them and you will get better with them, of course, but they cannot last for too long. So as we talked before, dry the teeth for mechanical retention. If you're putting your, um, uh, your uh, PPMA on the teeth that are wet, you will, um, you will not get mechanical retention. You will remove the material after two minutes with your putty that you are used for your wax up and you will find that the material came out so you don't have any mechanical retention. So what do you want to do? Make sure that there's good uh, medium, which the teeth are not very wet. Put your uh, material and then remove the putty, peel it off, and you will hopefully find it in place. Of course, you can use spot etching and bonding. What does that mean? You just etch on the tooth, the prepared tooth. You choose two or three teeth, maybe this one and this one and that one, and then you uh, spot etch it and spot bond it. Means just the spot, not the whole surface, of course. And then you will put your material, it will stick. You will have chemical uh, retention, okay? Some tips for getting a good uh, temporary uh, friendly, uh, gingival, gingival friendly temporaries. Stay away from the gingiva as much as possible. Just stay away from the gingiva because uh, don't forget that you just retracted the gingiva and you're putting your PPMA, you're putting your material, and you're pushing the gingiva, and then you will have 
the patient waits for one week, two weeks. If you don't stay away from the gingiva, you will have permanent recession. This is very important and very dangerous. Um, and also you have to polish, keep the polish surface because polished surfaces are gingiva friendly. What I like to do is go inside here, remove any excess with my uh, explorer and um, I will do that during the curing because these materials typically have two minutes of curing time. So I will go after one minute and flick away the excess if I made a sculpted putty, okay? So it would be nice if you use magnification in this step because you don't want to be using any uh, burrs and preparing the tooth. You want to just touch the temporary. And of course, if you didn't prepare all that much from the teeth and you're still within the enamel, you just, sometimes you don't really need to do any temporaries for your patient, just make them uh, live with their enamel, prepared enamel until the veneers come back. And this is a nice video that I will talk to you about. The prepared teeth, this is the putty that uh, is thick and has a resistant form, resistance form. And here we come after one minute, flick away the putty, uh, the PMA, and then, okay, everything's out of the way. Peel it and everything is in place. Continue polishing these surfaces, remove any excess, don't push the gingiva and don't touch the teeth and good luck. Polish the surfaces and that's it. This is a good example of the temporary, okay? Um, that's it, that's everything for today. We're almost one hour in. I hope you found this informative. Um, next time we will talk about part three, veneers assessment, when you get the veneers from your lab, how to assess them and how to deliver them. Uh, so mainly we will talk about how to functionally assess the veneers and that will include stuff that are not aesthetics, but you need to check the fundamental healthy um, aspects of the veneers and then you will we will talk about how to assess the veneers that just came from the lab uh, from an aesthetic point of view. And of course, bonding them, preparing the tooth surface, preparing the ceramics and bonding them, okay? Uh, and here you can follow us on social media and that's it, everything for today.